Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was told to turn this on. I'm not sure if it's working. It's on. Okay, as long as it's on. Well, I'm so glad to be back here. It's so wonderful when we come and spend the day with, with the folk here. Um, since I've seen you last, something has changed in my life. Um, some of you know that I have married. And my wife, Christina, is there, and she joined me last time we came together, but we were not then husband and wife. We were just talking about that this morning. We said, oh yeah, that's right, we were coming here last time, we were not yet married. So that's something different, but truly, and I mean this sincerely, we really enjoy coming here, spending time here in Mountain Home. And I just counted an honor and a privilege to be here and to share the Word of God with you. Uh, of course, uh, some of my Napa friends are here, and I appreciate them coming and just spending time with, with all of us together. Uh, this particular topic is a topic that I struggled with just a little bit, you know. I want you to know, because the topic of righteousness by faith is a topic that, well, we're studying in our lesson. And I thought, well, can I really say anything different or new as it pertains to the lesson? But the more I thought about it and the more I prayed about it, it kept coming up, don't change it, keep it the same. So our lesson today is, the just shall live by faith. Would you please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, it's a uh, passage that we all know, but it is a very, very important passage, like some of the others we'll be reading today. Hebrews chapter 10, and let's begin by looking at verses 35. And we'll read up to about 38. I also didn't wear glasses last time I was here, so I guess I'm going to have to put them on. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35. We'll start there. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. What should we not do? Cast away our confidence. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall come, and he will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Let's go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Of course, we've been studying the book of Galatians. How do you enjoy this lesson? Are you enjoying this lesson? Oh, yeah. It's, it really is deep. It's rich. It's got Galatians. It's a great book. And here in chapter 3, verse 11, it says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by what? By faith. This is actually a quotation from the book of Habakkuk in chapter 2. We won't read it today, but it's actually that statement was made not in the New Testament originally, but in the Old Testament. And of course, the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for what? For righteousness. The word account is, means to be given the credit for. And so, this, high, this idea of living by faith is not new, in the new, it's not just in the New Testament, it's actually all throughout the Bible. The subject of righteousness by faith is in fact a subject that is the foundation for every doctrine, every truth throughout Scripture. There's a sign here, maybe you can't see it, those of you who have been up here, it says, we would see Jesus. And that's really what this subject of righteousness by faith is all about. Now, there are different views of righteousness by faith, but there's a particular phase I would like us to focus on today. You might have heard this parable or this story. It's the story of a frog, the frog and the scorpion. Have you heard that story about the frog and the scorpion? Okay, I'm sure you have. Most of you might have. There's a story that it goes like this. There's a frog sitting by the bank of the river, and uh, while he's there, a scorpion approaches him and says, Mr. Frog, of course the frog is, you know, very frightened, oh, a scorpion, oh no, this is the end of me now. And the scorpion says, oh no, don't be afraid. I just want to get, a, get across the river, I want to get to the other side. 
frog says, oh, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to take you across there. And the scorpion says, oh, no, don't worry. I just want to ride on your back. Oh, no, 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 says the frog. When we get into the middle of the river, you'll just sting me and then, you know, I'll die. Well, the scorpion says, well, that's foolish. Well, why in the world would I do that? Because if I stung you, well, then we'll both die. The frog said, hmm, well, that's kind of true. But then the scorpion says, furthermore, I need to get across to the other side of the river. So the frog, the frog thought about it and said, hmm, I guess that kind of does make sense. You know, why would he sting me in the middle of the river when we both die and he needs to get across? So he says, OK, all right, jump on my back. So they start off in the river and as they're going across the river to get into the middle and suddenly the scorpion stings him. And guess what happens? Well, of course, scorpion stung him. So the frog begins to feel the effect and he realizes he's dying. And they're both going to drown. So the frog, in his last, you know, bit of consciousness, says to the scorpion, why did you do this? Why? Guess what the scorpion said? I can't help myself. It's my nature. He said, but we're both going to die. And the scorpion said, I don't know. I couldn't do any better. That's just part of my nature. Now, that sounds ridiculous. But the truth of the matter is, is that really the human family is very much like that scorpion. We do things that bring our own destruction. Why? Because of our human nature, our carnal nature. We were born with that nature, like the scorpion, even to our own detriment, we will do things that bring us harm. Why? Because we can't help ourselves. That's what the scorpion said. I can't change it. I can't help it. I just felt like stinging you. I had to do it. Because that's a part of our natures. We were all born that way. But thank God that Jesus came. And as a result, we have an opportunity to avoid the death, the destruction, the eternal destruction that comes. That we know is going to happen to those who do not embrace Jesus Christ. We call that justification. Isn't that what we call it? Justification. That's called justification by faith. Aren't you glad that Jesus came and gave us the opportunity to be saved from the end result of sin? What are the wages of sin? What does the Bible say it is? The, the wages of sin is death. And we are responsible for that because we just can't help ourselves. But now you and I have accepted Jesus as our Savior, and I trust everyone here has. If you have not, please do it today. But since we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, what do you think happens? Well, Jesus came, he forgave us of our sins, and now we get to start afresh. But we still have the nature of the scorpion. The purpose of the gospel is not just to save us from our past sins but to save us from our sins today. And you say, well, that's, an un that's a daunting task. How can it ever be? Well, first of all, let's take a look at Revelation. No, I'm sorry, let's go to Romans. Or the, our reading today, our scripture reading, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And what does that say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the what? I, I can't hear you. What is it? The power of God unto what? Salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by what? By faith. So, what does the Bible mean when he says this? Well, first of all, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power, the dynamite. Actually, I understand that the original word there, Greek word, actually means something. That, in fact, it's where we get our word dynamite today. It's the power of God unto what? Salvation. And then he goes on to say, from faith to faith, when he says, because the just shall live by faith. Now, please note very carefully, he's not speaking about those just embracing Jesus Christ. He's talking about those 
who already have been justified by accepting Jesus as their Savior. You say, well, how do I know that? Well, the Bible says, the just, he will live by faith. Now, who is just? Only those, Jesus is, but only those who have embraced the gospel, who have embraced Jesus' sacrifice and his life. In other words, it's saying, he that has been justified will now walk by what? By faith. Does that make sense? That's what the Bible says. The just, he that has been justified, shall live by faith. This is referring to people who know Jesus already. They have been justified, and so they're called here the just. And he says, now, once you have been justified, you must now walk by, by faith. This is not referring to what we all did when we embraced Jesus as our Savior. This particular phrase is really referring to those who know Jesus already. And he's saying, I need you to walk by faith. If you know Jesus and you have been justified, you will walk by faith. So what exactly does this mean to walk by faith? But let's come to that. I want you to know that this subject that we're studying today is so important it's so critical because it is the heart and the foundation of every truth in Scripture. It all points to Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, I want to clarify, I'm not speaking about doing works. We're not talking about works here. We're talking about the just living by faith, not works. Did you notice that? There's a difference. He didn't say the just is going to live by how hard he tries or how much effort you put into it. He says you will live by faith. So, let's, let's take a look at that. Well, what exactly does that mean? But it's interesting that in the 1888 General Conference, God sent two men, their names is A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Have you heard of, any of you heard of these, these men? Okay. A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, uh, one was an editor, I believe, the other was a doctor. And they were allowed to, to give presentations in the General Conference. And their presentation was on righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. And you say, well, the church already knew that. But there's something here that they felt impressed to bring, and Ellen White actually supported what they, what they had taught. And listen to what she says. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through elders Wagoner and Jones. This is in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 91 and 92. Testimonies to Ministers, 91 and 92. She says, this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. So it presented justification by faith. But it also invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. You know, it's interesting that... One of the reasons why I struggled with this passage just a little bit, this subject, I should say, is because as Adventists, and many of you know this, we have been in the past prone to legalism. Got to keep the law. Don't do this. Don't do that. You mustn't do this. You want to make sure you do this. And we focus so much on the do's and the don'ts and the law and all that, that we've missed Jesus altogether. And that's what she's saying here. But on the other hand, we, go, we can go to the other extreme, and the other extreme is, well, we accept Jesus as our Savior, and we kind of think we're going to coast into heaven, everything is all right, I just be the best I can. In other words, we end up being moral people, and we don't want to be just moral people. Christ did not die to just make moral people. There are people in the world who are moral, aren't they? There are moral people. Now, I'm not trying to be critical or anything like that. I, I, I'm really looking at myself, at all of us. And so we don't want to find ourselves being the kind of Christian, we accept Christ as our Savior, and then we just kind of think, well, you know, I'll just do the best I can, and, and you know, I, I just make sure I don't kill and steal and cheat, and we don't want to be that type of Christian either. Paul here and the Bible is describing Christianity that is beyond that. It's a life of faith. And so we'll come back to that in more detail. But listen to what she goes on to say. Many had lost sight of Jesus, his changeless love for the human family. So we had lost sight of Jesus. 
This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. What's going to prepare the world to hear the gospel, what's really going to prepare us to give the gospel, is this message of righteousness by faith. That's really what's going to do it. That's what she's saying here. She's saying, this is the message that God intends to be given to the world, and it's the message that we need to have so that we can proclaim the loud cry. In other words, in order to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, in order to, to impact the world, we need to have a clear understanding and to be able to exemplify and have, in effect, the righteousness of Christ. And we of ourselves can't do this. We cannot ever, ever, by what we do, attain or earn our salvation. Doesn't matter how long you've been an Adventist or a Christian. Doesn't matter how, if you sing in the choir or if you, uh, you know, you preach, you teach, you, whatever. That doesn't, that doesn't account at all, per se. In other words, what really ultimately counts is a heart that is filled with faith and Jesus Christ comes in. But how do we do that? Again, we're coming back to that. So, this is such an important message. It's so crucial, brothers and sisters, that we try to grasp the lesson that we're studying in Galatians. And that we grasp this issue, this, this text, this uh, subject of righteousness by faith. And what it means, the just shall live by faith. So, what is faith exactly? What does the Bible say faith really means? What is faith? We can... I think we all know it means to believe in God. You know, sometimes I, I uh, you know, you're watching television or you listen on the radio and you hear people say, oh, he's a man of faith or he's a person of faith. Or maybe they're talking about evolution and they say, well, you know, uh, that's the thing about faith. You know, there's no evidence for it. You just believe it. That's not really altogether true. Faith is based on something. What is faith based on? Paul says, believing in what you can't see. Believing what you can't see. That's true. That's true. But you know, the Bible says that faith, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. That's right. It's based on the fact that what God says, He will do. What God says, He will do. Now, I want to read another statement to you from a book called Messages to Young People. And I think this will kind of hopefully kind of focus things a little bit more for us, I'm hoping. Righteousness within is testified by righteousness without. He who is righteous within is not hard-hearted and unsympathetic, but day by day he grows unto the image of Christ, going from strength to strength. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. That's a pretty, that's a mouthful. Ministry, as I think it's uh, Messages to Young People, page 35. Now, there's some big words there that I thought we should kind of look at a little bit before we, we, we continue. Imputed. What is imputed? She says, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. But the righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. In other words, to be justified. Everyone knows what justification is, right? Okay. When we accepted Christ, what happened? He gave, forgave us of our past sins. Amen. Can you say amen to that? And he says, now, you don't have to worry about the penalty of the law. I bore it all for you. You have a fresh start. That's imputed righteousness. It means he accounted us to be righteous forensically, but we're actually not righteous in and of ourselves. So when God sees us, he sees Jesus. That's true. That's called imputed or accounted righteousness. But the word sanctification 
means that we are sanctified, we are changed, that righteousness is imparted. That means we actually become. You know, when I was a little boy, I remember, and some of you mothers will probably remember this, when I was a little boy, I, um, I, liked, I tried to write, you know, and of course, you know, little boys, you know, it just looks like a bunch of scribbles. Right? Did your, did your scribbles, your writing look like that? I would think so, right? Oh, well, mine surely did. And, and as I was scribbling and writing, trying to write my name, my mother would come along and say, come, let me help you here a little bit. And, you know, and then I would, she would hold my hand, you know, with the pen. I barely knew how to hold a pen right, you know. And I'm looking up at her, and she's forming my name. You know, you know how it goes, kids, right? You, you remember that, mothers, right? Don't you remember that? Or is it just me? No? Okay. So at any rate, uh, you know, she would, for, and I'm looking up at her, and I'm smiling, you know, I'm grinning from ear to ear. I'm so happy. I'm writing my name, you know. She called me Tony, you know, at the time, like a lot of people do. And so then I, I wrote T-O-N-Y, and I'm just, oh. And then at the end, she said, look what you did. You wrote your name. And I'd go, oh, yes, and I'm so happy. Oh, I wrote my name. You know, I'm excited. Did I write my name? All I did was hold a pen. She actually did it all. You know what I mean? Well, that's imputed righteousness. I didn't write my name. But she said I did. And, it's, and in fact, you know, uh, she did. All I did was hold a pen. That's imputed righteousness, so to speak. My little microphone is falling here. My little clip came off. <laughs> okay, we'll get that. That's what I'm going to do. Just stick it in my pocket. I've seen it happen to other people. Now it's happened to me. Okay. So, that's imputed righteousness. But now, if my mother could say, Son, I'm going to show you now how you can do that. I will teach you. I will help you to do it. As if she could touch me and suddenly I could write my name, that would be imparted righteousness. You're getting the idea? That means I actually have received the ability to write. Now, of course, it's not through me. It's still through, it would have been through her. It's the same thing with Jesus, and that's what she's referring to here. When we first accept Jesus as our Savior, when we accept Him into our hearts and into our lives, He accounts us to be righteous, and He says, all right, the Father sees Jesus. He doesn't see you. But deep down inside, we are still what? We're still really sinners. And so then we need to continue a process by which then we are changed. And so then that becomes the imparted righteousness. One, another example is a driver's license. It's as if I could say, what is your son's name? Son? Yes. Andrew. Andrew. Ah. It's as if I could say to Andrew, here's a driver's license. Oh, look at that grin. You see that? <laughs> and I say, here's a driver's license. You are now a driver. You, see, it says, your picture, state of Idaho, driver's license. Would you trust him to drive you? No. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's a crude illustration, but the point is, that is righteousness by imputation. But now... Let's say after giving him the driver's license, I said, now, Andrew, uh, now that you are legal in the state of Idaho, um, you're going to need to drive. But you know what? Uh, <clears throat> you, you really don't know how to drive. But guess what? I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you uh, to drive. And so after a while, guess what? Andrew will know how to drive. That's imparted righteousness. The message that was brought in 1888 is the message of righteousness by impartation. We all know about justification, but the whole idea here is that God wants us to keep in mind that the just shall live by what? By faith. Once we have gotten our driver's license, so to speak, now, now, we have to learn to drive, not in our own power. And we'll come to that. Not in our own strength, by faith. And we'll talk more about what that means. But it's critically important to understand. Because we can have all the knowledge in the world. We can have everything that we need in the world, we think. We can do all the good works that we can. But if we do not have 
But you do not have Jesus' righteousness, not just through justification, but by him working through us day by day, then we will not, we're not growing. We're not being fitted fitted for the kingdom. That's why she says here, the first is our title to heaven. That's imputation. But our fitness for heaven is what is meant by what? Impartation. Are you getting the idea? I trust that you're getting the idea here, brothers and sisters. This is crucially important. You know, I, I heard two pastors talking. Uh, well, I shouldn't say I heard them talking. I heard a story about two pastors talking. And two pastors said, you know, uh, John, I think I'm going to try to be more loving. You know, I'm going to be more loving and I'm going to try to, uh, you know, I've been trying to stick to the law, make sure I don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing and so forth. And not that anything was wrong with that, but he was trying to hit at a, a problem of legalism. And he decided that, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, focus so much on the do's and the don'ts and all that. I'm going to start focusing on loving people. And so then the, the two men, the two pastors agreed to do this and they went out doing it. And uh, then about oh, a few weeks later, they came back together and one, the other pastor said, you know, you know, uh, Harry, <laughs> I think I'm going to go back to keeping the commandments. This love business is too tough. And, and you know, th there, there, is, there is real truth in that. God is interested in the heart, in the real character change. That's what he really wants. It's not the external, because we are not saved by the works of the law. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God, Galatians says. But it's through faith. It's through faith. One more example. Um, let's say, for example, there's a man who's a thief. Do you know what a kleptomaniac is? What is a kleptomaniac? It's a guy that can't stop stealing. He just... So this guy robs a bank. He, he robs the bank. And after robbing the bank, he decides that, um, you know, he's going to rob another and then another and another. Oh, before you know it, he's, oh, he's stolen hundreds and thousands of dollars. But one day he's caught and he's brought before the judge. And the judge says, all right, buddy, that's it for you. You are going to jail or you pay back the one million dollars that you have stolen. And... Uh, and the man says, well, I don't have a hundred, you know, I don't have a million dollars. I don't, I only have ten dollars in my account. Of course, he spent all the money. You understand how that goes. So he uh, stands before the judge and he's in trouble. The man on the hill, who's the richest man in the world, shall we say, he has a huge mansion on the hill and he enjoys coming down and helping people when he can, those who are willing to let him help. So he comes down. The man happens to be in court that day and he comes and he, he says, uh, your Honor, can I speak with this man a little bit, please? And the, the Honor says, okay. And so the man says, I'll represent him, Your Honor. So he talks to him and he says, look here, sir, um, I can represent you, but uh, you're in big trouble. So why don't you let me um, pay, pay your debt? I'll pay the million dollars. What? Oh, yeah, no strings attached. All you have to do is just let me do it. Just accept my gift. He says, oh, that's all? He says, yeah. That's all you have to do. Just accept my gift. And so sure enough, he says, okay. So he accepts the gift. The man pays the bill and says, you're free to go, sir. You're free to go. Oh, really? That's it? He said, yeah. You're a free man. You're a good citizen, as if you are a great citizen. You're perfect now. So he goes out on the street, and he's happy, and he's rejoicing. And then he sees this beautiful diamond in the jewelry store. What do you think he wants to do? He wants to steal it. And he knows if he steals, he's going to end up back in the same position. And he may not have that benefactor any longer. But, but he can't help it, you see. He's tempted. He's trying as hard as he can. But sooner or later, he goes back to stealing. Well, that's justification. And Jesus did that for us. But the just living by faith means that now... We accept Jesus Christ, not only to deliver us from our past sins, but to walk with us day by day by day by faith. So that we can be changed, so that his character can be imparted to us. Does that make sense? You getting the idea? This man still wants to steal. When we accepted Jesus as our Savior, the carnal nature didn't die instantly. 
And so we need to be fitted for heaven. And that's where this balance of the law and faith comes in. So let's talk about faith. What is faith? Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith it is what? Impossible to please God. That's what Hebrews eleven six 6 says. We're going to look at a lot of passages here just a little bit. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this one thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of what? To the day of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, don't be discouraged. I know you're thinking, oh no, I could never. I, you know, I mean, I can never be good. Of course we can't be good. I, I mean, I don't see myself being saved because there's just no way I could ever make it. It's interesting that the Bible says in Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are they that keep His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. But yet, we can never, ever, in and of ourselves, do anything good. And no matter how good we may appear, no matter what we may do, it can never atone for the righteousness of Christ. We could, it would never make us ready for heaven. But... If by faith we do so and allow the Lord to work in us the will and to do of his good pleasure, we can do it. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. God not only does it through you, but he gives you the will to do it. Isn't that beautiful? That's what he says. Did you get that? It says, For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his what? Good pleasure. The desire to do it comes from God, and the power to do it comes from God. Yes, that's exactly correct. Let's go to the book of uh, Zechariah chapter 3. I, I want you to just look at that very quickly. Zechariah chapter 3. And it uh, starts actually with verse 1. And he shewed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto, him, unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Brothers and sisters, we are standing like Joshua with filthy garments. We are terrible. We are filthy. We're just nothing. We, do, we, just, we just have terrible garments. And Satan is there ready to say, you know what? I look at you. You are never going to make it. You can never be what you're supposed to be. No, God. No, no, no. You're not going to make it. You ever felt that way? I think we all have at some point in our lives. But God is also standing there. Because the Bible says Joshua was standing before the Lord, the angel of the Lord. He was standing in God's prayer, but Satan was there accusing him and saying, no, nope, nope, you're never going to make it, buddy. Look, you're filthy. Now, look what it says in verse 3. But now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the Lord. Verse 4, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, This is what the, what the Lord did for him. It says, Take away the filthy garments from him, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity, your sin, to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of what? Of raiment. Did you notice, by the way, that he didn't say, you know, let me take that to the laundry, you know, and wash that for you. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, well, let me just get rid of some of these stains uh, over here. He took his garments off completely and gave him what? A clean set of garments. It's interesting. God is interested in changing us, and that is the power of the gospel. If we have not changed, if we're not changing, if we're not growing, it may mean that we're not getting our garments exchanged. But that is the point of the gospel of living by faith. It's not just, well, I'm not so bad, you know, I, I, I you know, I've... You know, I, I don't kill and steal and cheat. Yeah, I don't do all of that. God is not interested in just making us decent people. The purpose of the gospel is to make us whole. To take away our filthy garments. But we, can, we can't do that by working harder. By trying to do good, as we're going to see. Let's look at another one. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22, and if you take a look there at verses uh, 11 and 12, uh, it's, it's a long story, but we'll just read those two verses. You remember the story of the parable of uh, the dinner, 
Many were bidden to the dinner and the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is a symbol of the kingdom of God, of the coming of the Lord and the reestablishment of his, of his kingdom and so forth. We know that that's the time that this will take place. Now, he invites all these people and of course, as the culture and the custom was, when you went to a marriage supper, you had to wear the garment that was provided for you, not your own. But this one person came in with his own garment. He, he refused to, for whatever reason, receive the garment of the host. He, he didn't want to wear it. And so then in verse, in verse 11, he says, And when the king came to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither not having a, weather, uh, rather a wedding garment? And he was speechless. In other words, he came in with his own righteousness. Brothers and sisters, there might be many of us, uh, I, I, I'm sure God, God knows our hearts and uh, we all have to look at ourselves. We don't want to go into God's kingdom trying to have our own righteousness, our own character. We want to have the righteousness that Jesus Christ provides for us. That's what we need. That's the righteousness that we need. And we can only get that, as we'll see, by faith. And so then you see that what God wanted to do was to take away his filthy garments and give him his own righteous, pure white garment. That's what Jesus wants to do for all of us. It's not just about justification by faith. It's about walking by faith. And that's what is critical and very, very important for us. Now, let's look. There's a number of passages, and we don't have time to read them all, but maybe we can look at Philippians. Go to the book of Philippians. Philippians. We'll be flipping, speaking of Philippians, back and forth for a little bit here. Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Philippians 3, 9 and 10. And he found in him, that's Paul speaking, and be found in him not having mine own, what? Righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. In other words, then, we, he, we need to know the power of God's resurrection. And it's all by faith. Did you notice that? It's all by faith. That's what he's referring to. Let's look at another one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses, uh, oh, let's start with verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. This is interesting. This is how we walk by faith. We walk by faith because God has said in his word that he wants to change us. He wants to make us like him. We've got to believe that if we are to grow and to progress in the Christian faith, if we are to be what the Lord wants us to be, we have to meditate on his word, meditate and know that the same word that said, let there be light, is the same word that can change us. Do you believe that? Don't sound like you really believe it. Do you really believe that God can change you? It doesn't matter what the struggle is. It doesn't matter how much pain you're going through. God is there for you. He will be with you. He'll help you. He will direct your life if we just completely surrender to him. Uh, let's look at another one. How about Titus chapter 3 verse 7? Titus chapter 3 verse 7. And Titus, as you know, is going there uh, towards Hebrews. Titus chapter 3 verse 7. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, verse 8, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, those that have what? Believed in God, be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. You see, there's nothing wrong with good works. We just realize that those good works are not what saves us. 
It's the faith that we have in looking at Jesus, surrendering to him, acknowledging that he can do that. By beholding, we become change. And we'll talk, with that, talk about that in just a little bit. Now, listen to this statement. I'd like you to, to just think for a moment about the statement. And we'll be closing up soon. But in Desire of Ages, pages 6, 6, 8. Desire of Ages 668. It's a very, very powerful statement that, that we have here that helps us to kind of get, a, I hope, a, a clearer glimpse of what the Lord has in store for us. The Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. What is the Lord, dis, what is he disappointed? When we place a low what? Estimate upon ourselves. He wants to save us. He can save us. We can't do it of ourselves. But he says he doesn't want us to think of ourselves as low. Why, she says, because he desires his chosen heritage to value themselves according to the price he has placed upon them. And what price did he place upon us? He died. I mean, he risked everything for us. And then he says, and she goes on to say, actually, but to pray in Christ's name means much. It means that we are to accept his character, manifest his spirit, work his works. The Savior's promise is given on condition. If you love me, he says, do what? Keep my commandments. All true obedience comes from the heart. All true obedience comes from where? From the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, now this is the key, if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Now, this is incredible. Did you realize this is what Christ is actually saying? As we look at Christ, we read his word. It's not about, well, I got to go and do this today. I got to do this. Oh, I have to make sure I don't do this. Uh, oh, I don't want to do this. But oh, what a, what a drudgery. What a terrible, terrible pain and anguish this is to do this and that and the other. It's not like that. What the Lord is saying here is what she's saying is, is that as we look on the Savior, as we yield ourselves to him, as we meditate on his word, and as we seek and, and surrender to him daily, that's the real struggle is to surrender. But as we do that, she says, our own impulses, our own thoughts will be that of his. I mean, it just happens naturally. Do you have to tell a, a rose bush to smell sweet? It just naturally smells sweet, doesn't it? Why? It's in the DNA. It's in the DNA. It will, it's a rose, so it's naturally going to smell nice. It, it will look beautiful. It's in the DNA. Ask God to change our DNAs. That's what we need. And that's what the gospel is about. Ultimately, the just shall live by faith because he wants to change our DNA if we would just consent. That's the struggle. It's a struggle of faith, not a struggle of doing the work. Because sooner or later you'll be discouraged. You will be so discouraged because no matter, we can never reach that standard. That's not the way to go about it. You can't get to New York City by going across the Pacific, the westward. You have to go east. You get the idea? You, you, you can't make it that way. So if we're ever going to, to reach the potential that God has for us, it's surrendering our hearts to his will. Listen to what she goes on to say, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with our last two passages. She says, the will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Now let's read that again. Listen to what she says. Through appreciation of Christ's character, one, through communion with God, prayer and reading his word, and meditating on that word, sin will become, what? Hateful to us. This is powerful. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's what it means. It's not just justifying us, it's also sanctifying us. 
imparting his character to us. It's, it's nothing that we can do. It's looking at him, beholding him. You know, if you're going to be a doctor, what do you have to do? You have to study, right? And you have to study how doctors think. You have to study how the terminology of doctors, don't you? Or a lawyer, same thing. You've got to learn the terminology. You've got to learn how they think, learn the, the protocols and the rules of law, or, or if it's the medical field, whatever it is. You've got to learn that. But guess what? As you are studying, what happens to you? You start to think like a doctor. Or you start to think like a lawyer. Isn't that right? Well, that's the same thing here, brothers and sisters. It's the same here. As we meditate and commune on the character of Jesus Christ, what he wants for us, then, it, then before you know it, you naturally start doing the things that God wants us to do. It, it's just amazing. Just like the plant, you plant your tomato seed, and before you know it, it's just growing. Because it absorbs the soil, the moisture from the soil and all of the nutrients and the sunshine. It just, just bathes in it. And as it bathes in it, it just grows. And you wonder, how did that happen? That is the miracle of the gospel. Not just saying you are righteous, but actually making us more like Jesus Christ. Oh yes, it's the work of a lifetime. You know, you're never going to get to the point you can say, Ah oh, yes, I got it now. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the man. I got it. It's never going to happen that way. No, it's, it's constant growth. But the growth is soaking up Jesus and his sunshine of truth and the word. Let's look at our last two passages. Let's go to the book of Corinthians. And I believe that's 2 Corinthians that we want. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, actually, let's go to 17. I'd like to go back to 17 just a little bit, just to, to make a point. <clears throat> First, uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. I, I, I know that we, um, you know, I'm in my early years and growing up and when I first became an Adventist, uh, well, you know, well-meaning, uh, a lot of people would say, hey, don't do that. Oh, that's wrong. Oh, that's, that's not right. And it's not that what they said was wrong. It's true. But that's not what Jesus means by faith. Because in Christ there is liberty. There's liberty. You're free. You're free because Jesus loves you. You know he cares for you. You know that he is there with you. You're looking at him and he will fill you up and fill us up. Now I'm not telling you I've attained or anything like that now. So bear in mind I'm talking to all of us including myself. That there's liberty, there's freedom in Jesus Christ. You don't worry about, well, I, you know, I'm, man, I, I'm so discouraged, I didn't do this, oh, I'm not like that. You won't get discouraged like that. Yes, you might feel temptation to be discouraged, but then you'll rest on the faith that God loves you, and the same word that said, let there be light, is the same word that can change you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation in Jesus Christ. It's the same word that said, let there be light. That same power can change us and make us more like him. We just have to trust him and yield ourselves to him. Now, let's go on to verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, this is the key right here to walk by faith. He says, we changed, are changed into the same image by beholding His glory. That's really what it is. How are we changed into His glory? By beholding Him. Now you say, well, what is glory? What does that really mean? Well, in the King James, it says the word glory here, but really go back to the book of Exodus. It's the last passage. Exodus chapter 33. I, I just love this passage, and I, I thought it's a good one for us to close on. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 
33. Let's start with verse 13. We won't be able to read the entire thing. I, I just love this passage because it's encouraging, strengthening. By beholding, we become what? Changed. Isn't that what we just read? So, listen to what Moses said. Now, therefore, this is Moses praying to the Lord. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, shew me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. He's talking to the Lord. I, I just, it's so beautiful. He says, Lord, I want to know you. I really want to know you, Lord. That's what he's telling the Lord. I want to really, and Moses already knew the Lord, but he, he wanted more of him. He said, I really, really want to know who you really are. And Lord, if I have found grace in your sight, he says, please consider me and my people, consider this people. He's talking about Israel. And then the Lord responds, and the Lord says, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. I think that is so marvelous. Amen. The Lord said to him, you want to know me, but as you get to know me, you will find what? Rest in the Lord. It's not drudgery. It's rest. That tongue that we can't control, that those evil thoughts we can't control, the temptation to do these wrong things, whatever they may be, they might be simple, and we tend to hold on to them because we think it's not important. It's just a small thing. I didn't kill anybody. But the Bible here says, by beholding the Lord, we can be changed. And Moses is saying, Lord, I want more of you. I want to know more. I want to see and know more of you. And the Lord says, yes, I will do that. And you will find rest. Oh, this is so beautiful. Then, then he goes on to say this. Look in verse 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken for. Thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Oh, don't you want the Lord to say that about you? I know you by name. Then he says in verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee. That's what Moses is saying. Shew me your glory. Remember what we read in Paul. Paul says, from glory to glory, by beholding we become change. And so what does that glory really mean? You would think of this majestic bright light that comes from the Lord. Is that what the Lord is really talking about when he says glory here? Well, no, not exactly. We, that's a part of it, of course. Now, verse 19 and 20 and 21 and 22, we don't have time to read. But basically the Lord says, all right, I'll do this for you. I'll let you see my glory. All right. But, you know, you can't see my face. If you see my face, you're not the end of you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to put my hand over you. Then I'm going to pass by. And as I pass by, I let you see my glory, but only the glory of my hinder part. You see, I'll move my hand a little bit so you can see just enough. And we said, if I don't do this, you're, that's it. So the Lord does that. He puts him in the rock. The cleft of a rock, and he put his hand over him, and the Lord passed by. And listen to what the Lord said. Look in chapter 34, verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him, and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, merciful, and gracious, and long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the uh, children's children, unto the third and fourth generations. What did the Lord show him? Did he show him all the majesty of his brightness and his power? Did the rocks rent? And is that what he showed him as his glory? No. What did the Lord show as his glory? He showed him his character. He said, the Lord who's long-suffering, the Lord who's merciful and gracious and long-suffering and full of goodness, that's what he showed him. That's what the glory means. That's the real glory of the Lord. It's not just his brilliance. It is his character. And Paul says, by beholding, we become changed 
from glory to glory. Do you want to be an overcomer? Do I want to be an overcomer today? Do we want to walk by faith? It's not what we do that's so important. Don't get me wrong, yes. If we obey the Lord, if we try to, you know, force ourselves to do what's right, it will be drudgery and we'll be discouraged. But if we let the Lord work in us, if we behold Him and, and meditate on His character and study His Word and commune with Him like Moses and say, I want to know you, Lord, help me, Lord, then before you know it, you just start doing the things that God wants you to do. The works will come. And that's why He says, blessed are they that keep His commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. That's why he can say that, because they are the ones who have beheld his glory and have surrendered to him. And so that all the parts of their lives are at his disposal. By faith, they believe that the same word that said, let there be light is the same word that can make them whole. The paraplegic, all the miracles that Christ wrought, what do you think he was trying to do? What was he trying to say to us? The same creative power that made the paralytic whole can make our paralytic soul whole. He can do it if we just let him. That's the power of the gospel. And it's only achieved by faith. That's the only way. I want to leave these words with you. Brothers and sisters, it is my desire, and I hope it is your desire, that you can get to the point that your very thoughts and impressions are that of the Lord's. That He will impart His righteous character to you, and that He will help you to write your name. Really, I should say write His name. His name is Jesus. And He loves us. And there's nothing, no trouble, no problem, no trial, life or death that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. And there's no power on earth that can prevent Him from making us whole if we just let Him. Thank you so much. May God bless you. And may we all draw nearer and still nearer to our Savior. In Jesus' name. Thank you.